Both of us had careers, and in order for our children, we felt to be raised for the Lord, one of us would need to stay home. When Jesus came to this earth, and he came riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem, announcing his kingdom, who was it that proclaimed him as the king? It was the children. It's saying what has been will be, just as the children proclaimed the coming king, so also the children in the last days will have that final message in their possession. start when they're really small. When our children were just babies, we would play them scripture song tapes, but we realize their minds are like sponges and they will soak up what comes their way. The parents who had success in raising spiritually strong young adults actually viewed it as their job. Not the church, not the pastor, not the church school. It was their job. If we can set aside a little bit of time every day for reading the Bible together, it will go a long way. All of these daily challenges of being a parent will finally come to this point where you see that the majesty of heaven is approved of your work. Not because you did everything perfectly, but because you walked with Him. When you fell down, you got back up. Because you were willing to be different. Because you were willing to guard their hearts. Because you were willing to say, this is my number one job in life and I'm going to make sacrifices. Because you were willing to take the time to prepare family worships, to prepare Bible, Bible study with the children, to weave Jesus into their experience. You were willing to make all the sacrifices needed to disciple your children, moms and dads. Because permissive parents let their kids do pretty much what they want. They're not thinking about their kid's future. Parents who are too harsh, they are very demanding. They're thinking mostly of themselves and their own personal convenience, not the growth of their child. And so every Christian home should have rules. We should point out the way in unmistakable terms because if we don't, if we have homes of no discipline and raise children who have no order, discipline, obedience, and submission to authority, then what we're giving them is a petting viper to cherish and it'll bite them and everyone around and eternally lose their souls. So when, when you're dealing with them in their sin, you are teaching them more about God's grace and forgiveness and about the gospel than at any other time. What a wonderful opportunity. If you're beating your head against the wall over your child's behavior, we all struggle with our children's behaviors, okay? We all have moments of discouragement, even, even despair. Because I can press on with all of my strength and all of my strategies and all of my doing my best as a parent. But if I don't have the power of God, I got nothing. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to take a look at this, this topic that, that we know is so important to you, and that is the topic of our, our children and their, their training, their education, how we can help them to love Jesus, help them to be prepared for his soon coming. And Lord, we know that you've empowered us and entrusted us with the task of sharing the everlasting gospel and the message of hope and warning with this, this perishing world. 
in these remaining days that we have of Earth's history. And so we just pray that you'd give us clarity of thought and inspiration and understanding of your will for us regarding our children. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the Raising the Remnant Seminar. This is normally a multi-part, multi-hour series. And what we're going to do in this session is take some of the most important points, the highlights of the full Raising the Remnant DVD series, which is six DVDs long. We're gonna do one session, fast-paced, with a whole lot of information, borrowed mostly from two sources. I'm going to be looking at the modern research from the George Barnett Institute on how spiritually strong young adults are raised. And, and they've actually established that according to scientific procedures of, of research studies. And we're going to see that as well as some traditional Christian parenting councils from the 19th century coming from books like Child Guidance and others. So I'll get more into what those sources are in a moment, but I wanna begin with the most important source of all, and that is the Word of God. You, have you ever read in Deuteronomy 6? It talks about the commandments of God. And this Deuteronomy 6 passage was to the people at the time of Jesus, the single most important text in their whole Bible. Jesus was, was having a discussion with a teacher of the law one time, and he said, what was the most important commandment in the law? And the answer was, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength, and that was the first and greatest commandment. Well, that's where this is taken from. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, hold on right there, which words which he commands us, commands us he says, love the Lord thy God, that's the commandment. But you know what's in the previous chapter? Deuteronomy 5 has the Ten Commandments in it. So these words which I command you this day, the Ten Commandments, which sum up in the phrase, love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor as yourself, these words, notice this, shall be in thine heart. And we'll see whose heart they should be in in the next verse. Verse 7, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. So who is he speaking to? Who has children? Well, of course, parents do. So this text is especially targeted to the parents. Hide these words in your heart, teach them to your children, and shalt, thou shalt talk of these commandments, talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. You get the idea. The message is the commandments of God are to be hidden in your heart and then lived in the daily life with your children. We're going to get into that in some of the themes in the Raising the Remnant seminar. But you see it in the scriptures. This topic is very important to the Lord. It has last day's implications. If you study the prophecies in the book of Malachi, in the book of Joel, you find some fascinating things. It says in the book of Joel that there will be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And it says specifically that the young maidens, that your young daughters, that your young men will dream dreams and have visions. So it, there, it seems that it's indicating that the children and the youth will play a special part in the latter reign, in the last days, in the outpouring of the Spirit of God to empower the final final message and mission of the church. Similarly, in Malachi, let's turn to Malachi. This one is really interesting. It talks about the great and dreadful day of the Lord, that final climactic point in human history that we are cruising toward right now. And it says, at that time, something will happen. And this is what, Lord willing, we are fulfilling today in this seminar and in our homes. It says, in verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now that's a pretty, pretty dramatic, climactic statement. It's saying this day is coming where the Lord of hosts will come on the clouds of heaven and this earth will be laid bare and there will be left neither root nor branch. But then notice in verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah the prophet. Now, Jesus addressed this because the disciples were expecting Elijah to come before Jesus' first coming. 
And Jesus said, well, he has. If you're willing to accept it, John the Baptist was the Elijah who was to come. In other words, John the Baptist bore the Elijah message. He carried that message to the people. But it talks about this will be before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Which day of the Lord would you say is more great and dreadful? The first coming of Jesus or the second coming? The second. So if Elijah came the first time, I would expect an Elijah message also now in our time as we approach the really great and dreadful day of the Lord. What is the Elijah message? Read verse 6 with me. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Did you catch that? The Elijah message that we are privileged to be a part of in the last days is the hearts of the fathers turning toward the children and the hearts of the children turning toward the fathers. That's a beautiful picture of the reuniting of the family, isn't it? And that's not meant to leave mothers out. This is the family coming together, which implies that if they're turning toward each other, he's turning them. What way were they pointed before this then? Away from each other. Is that not what we see in our culture today? The breakdown of the family, the attack on the family. We could spend an enormous quantity of time just on the cultural, geopolitical, sociopolitical attack upon the family globally. Oh, I'm just holding back right now from launching into like 20 minutes on that because that is a major, major warning and red flag that we need to have. You know it. You see it everywhere. There is an attack on the family. The beautiful picture, though, in the prophecy that we're going to focus on today in the Raising the Remnant seminar is that God wants to not have the family pointed away from each other but pointed toward each other. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, the family coming back together. Now, Jesus said that in the last days, what we see around us today with the, the dissolving of the family, he said this would take place. Do you remember the passage where he talked about uh, a son will turn against his mother and a daughter against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so that's the situation we see today, sadly, in our culture. But we can be the counterexample to that. We can carry that Elijah message and we can go forth as those who have families that are the remnant. We talk about the remnant, those who are left, those who are remaining as faithful in the last days when the whole world is wondering after the beast. You know, the devil knows that this is his time. Because he's seen this at three key junctures in human history. I've thought through this issue of, if you take a look at the whole of redemptive history, what are the three most important moments in redemptive history? What are the three biggest, most climactic, history-changing periods in the whole story of redemption from beginning to end? And certainly the first coming of Jesus when he came to this earth as a baby incarnated, formerly the king of heaven, now a baby in the manger. What an amazing event that was followed, of course, by a holy life, a ministry of service, a sacrifice on the cross, resurrection and ascension. That whole picture of Jesus' first coming, we're going to call the biggest and most important thing that's ever happened in history, right? Now let's go back a little further in the history and you'll find another very important event. It was the time where God issued his law and wrote, that, wrote it on stone after he had taken his people out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery to the Egyptians to carry them into the promised land across the Red Sea with all these magnificent miracles. He's creating a people unto himself and giving his law. That was the first one. This was the second one in order here. I believe we are now in the third one. We are in the time of the judgment. Daniel 7 is happening right before the onlooking universe in heaven. The judgment scene is taking place and to be followed shortly by the second coming. So we'll call last day events, the close of probation, the judgment, and the second coming. We'll call that one event. We'll call the first coming of Christ one event. And we'll call the giving of the law and Mount Sinai and all of that with the Israelites one, one event. Okay, now notice something about all three of these. At each point in, in history, there is a special attack upon the children. Notice Pharaoh had that wicked edict of throwing all the babies in the Nile. Herod, same thing. Kill all the baby boys in and around Bethlehem, age two years old and younger. I mean, unbelievably, horrifically violent and, and wicked and dark and satanic. And we don't even want to dwell upon these things. But you notice right when God's getting ready to do something magnificent, the devil is going after the children. It's happening again today, isn't it? 
And not just by the, the deaths, deaths of many children through, through the death of the unborn, but also through an attack on them spiritually. And that's what we're talking about in this, in this seminar, is the spiritual development of our children. Because when we talk about raising the remnant, we're not just talking about be, people being saved in the last days. We're talking about children going forth with a message. Remember, that your young daughters, your young maidens will dream dreams and have visions. Have you noticed there's also a key point where the children are doing a great work? Who was it that saved Moses' life in this first instance? A little girl hiding in the bushes. And she jumps out and she says, oh, well, you need a nurse for that young that baby, don't you? Miriam saved the life of the prophet Moses, played a key role in the, in the history of Israel and their salvation. Of course, at the time of Jesus' first coming. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And at that time, the adults and the religious leaders were you know, grumpy about it. But the children were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said, if these children don't cry out, the stones will cry out. Now, just so in the last days, take a look at this statement. I think it just sums it up so well. As the children sang in the temple courts, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So in these last days, children's voices will be raised to give the last message of warning to a perishing world. It says this, when heavenly intelligences see that men are no longer permitted to present the truth, the spirit of God will come upon the children and they will do a work in the proclamation of the truth which the older workers cannot do because their way will be hedged up. You read about this in Bible prophecy. It's a time when, frankly, you can't do what you normally could do. Religious liberty is clamped down upon. Freedoms are being stripped away, and you hear about the mark of the beast and no buy, no sell, and all of this persecution. But the children, it says, can go forth and do these things when older members cannot. The quote goes on, in the closing scenes of this earth's history, many of these children and youth will astonish people by their witness to the truth, which will be born in simplicity, yet with spirit and power. In the near future, many children will be endued with the spirit of God and will do a work in proclaiming the truth to the world that at that time cannot well be done by the older members of the church. Isn't that an amazing statement? So when you look at this as parents, you're going, okay, you know, maybe I attended a parenting seminar to think about how to help my children behave well and how to have a little more order in our home. And those are awesome, noble aims. And what we need to do is, is couch that in the bigger picture of not only is God trying to, to save my children's souls for eternal salvation. I mean, that's a big picture, but it gets even bigger when you realize the mission that God has placed upon that child for his or her future. And I would say near future. Because if history continues at the pace it has in recent years, and frankly, even in recent months, I mean, we are speeding toward these closing scenes, and we can expect that things are going to be continuing to heat up as we approach the close of time. And the children today may still be, still be children when Jesus comes again. Now, take a look at this one right here. It says, before taking upon them the responsibilities of fatherhood and motherhood, Men and women should become acquainted with the laws of physical development, with physiology and hygiene, with the bearing of prenatal influences. If you're starting to perspire a little bit and get a little anxious, like, oh boy, I'm a parent and I don't know these things, just hang with me. You'll see the next quote kind of gives us a little breather, but it gets worse. With the laws of heredity, sanitation, dress, exercise, and the treatment of disease, they should also understand the laws of mental development and moral training. To assume the responsibility of parenthood without such preparation is a sin. Oh, man, like that's a burden. Now, how can I be a parent? I don't know how to do anything. Does anybody else wake up in the morning or have those frustrated moments where you're going, I have no idea what I'm doing? Like, me too. I mean, I don't do a parenting seminar because, like, I am the expert and I've got this figured out. No, I like to read. I like to study. I'm kind of a nerd and I like to teach. So that's about the reason that I do a seminar on parenting. I've got two precious boys, age five, age three, a third on the way. But um, I don't come to this from some seasoned wisdom of, you know, somebody who's got all of the answers on this. So I'm in the same boat as you, feeling like, whoa, a quote like that, or even just the daily life of feeling like a failure so often. I want you to know what the Lord says to us. It says this, parents may well inquire, who is sufficient for these things? God alone is their sufficiency. Do you agree with that? 
We can't do this. With man, this is impossible. I mean, think about the gravity of this narrative and the children who will go forth. And we're raising the final missionaries of Earth's history to finish the work. It's like, you know, this is kind of intimidating. But God alone is their sufficiency. So if we leave him out of the question, seeking not his aid and counsel, then yes, hopeless indeed is our task. But our task is not hopeful because we're not leaving him out, are we? We're here to ask the Lord to guide us, to empower us in this great work that we have in our homes. The burden is upon you, though. Some people are not aware of it. Whether you are sensible of it or not, the burden is upon you to train these children for God, to watch with jealous care the first approach of the wily foe, and be prepared to raise a standard against him. You are not secure a moment against the attacks of Satan. You have no time to rest from watchful, earnest labor. And that's why I'm glad you're here. Because apparently we can't just go into this in some cavalier manner and say, ah, you know what, it's just fun, you know, it's cute, having kids and whatever. No, this is, this is human souls and salvation on the line and their future happiness. And, and the devil, who's got his target directly on our children, we don't have a moment to rest from earnest, watchful labor. And this is not something that we go into in any sort of, uh, careless manner, but we want to guard the home against satanic influences. Now, I started with the end of this quote because I think everybody in here would say, yes, we want to guard our home against satanic influences. How do we do that? Let's look at the first part of the quote. It says, other families will mark the results attained by such a home, speaking of a godly home, and will follow the example set in their turn, guarding the home against satanic influences. So, in other words, the way that you guard the home against satanic influences is you mark the results of godly homes. You notice how godly homes are doing it. You follow their example. Now, this is kind of nice because we have modern research studies where they spend you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on, on uh, extensive studies, studying thousands and thousands of people across the country, and that's exactly what George Barna has done. He's gone out in search of the spiritually strong young adults of America, across the evangelical churches generally. Okay, He's wanted to find people who not just attend church, but regularly, I mean, that's, that's a, a very few, but actually read their Bibles, actually have a Christian worldview, actually tithe and give, give to the church, serve, and, and do the work of the Lord. So these are a very rare breed within the church, I'm sure you know. And so he went out in search of them to find out what kind of parenting they had as a child that, that helped produce them. And now we know, we've got the data, we've got the information, the research has been established on what kind of parenting policies and philosophies and methods and what kind of parenting produce these these excellent pillars of the churches of America today. Now the beautiful thing is everything that you read in George Barna's research, as I was going through this, I was also reading a book called Adventist Home. Now some of these quotations you're hearing, they're from books like Adventist Home, Child Guidance, the book Education, you'll hear a bunch of others. These are from the 19th century awesome, awesome. Like, they don't write like that anymore. I mean, this is like from the Lord stuff. And you'll notice as you're reading that 130-year-old, 120-year-old uh, parenting council, it's the same thing as the modern research. So George Barna hasn't really uncovered anything new. He's just confirming what we already know if we cared to read these old books. I love reading old books. I was a history guy. That's what my background is. Before I was a, a teacher, I was a, I was a, I was a history a teacher and a, and a political science and economics teacher, but that's always been my great love. But I've got to give you a quick disclaimer. We can look at all the research and we can say, okay, these are the methods that are most likely to produce spiritually strong children. But in a universe of free will, there are no guarantees, right? I mean, I know of only one perfect parent, and that was God. And he sadly and tragically watched one-third of the stars fall from heaven. That's what it says in Revelation. Stars represent angels. This is the fallen angels. This is Lucifer and his rebellion in heaven. One-third of his kids turned on him and left the faith, if you will. And so if there are older members listening to this and the children have left the faith, just, just take heart that God knows that feeling. He knows that pain he, because he's been through it long before. And it says in Isaiah 63, verse 9, that in our affliction, he is afflicted. So he knows that. He empathizes with it. He's been there. And so we do have free will. It says parents may do everything in their power to give their children every privilege and instruction in order that the children may give their hearts to God. Yet the children may refuse to walk in the light. Now, let's be careful with selective quoting because somebody who wants to be a little lackadaisical about this might select only that quote and go, 
Well, see, you know what? It's all just up to uh, blind luck and chance now because it's free will, and so, you know, I could do everything I can, and the children could choose to go this way, and so why bother? Is that a biblical Christian approach? No, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he was old, he will not turn from it. So we know that our, our, our methods do bear fruit, and so we can count on that promise that the Lord will finish that work in the children, and never negating free will, but to the extent that they will always have that seed planted in them, and we can do everything we can to give them the best chances possible. You follow? That's what we're going for today. So another quick disclaimer, though, speaking of selective quoting, you might look at a quote like this and end up on one side of the extreme. And then another quote we'll look at takes you to the other extreme. And we want to find the correct balance. It says children should not be led to feel that they cannot go out or come in without being watched. Suspicion demoralizes, producing the very evils it seeks. I know some people who subscribe to certain parenting philosophies where they would take this quotation and they'd say, see, we're just supposed to like kind of let the kids raise themselves, right? I mean, we don't want to be watching them all the time. Just let them run wild in the neighborhood and meet whoever they want to meet and, you know, just let it be, let it be, uh, you know, anarchy. It's like, that's not a good thing. So we, we, we want to also look at other quotations like this. Parents generally put too much confidence in their children. For often when the parents are confiding in them, they are in concealed iniquity. Parents, watch your children with a jealous care. So you see how that one helps to bring us a little bit more toward the middle. But if you took only this quotation, then you'd be like, mm, I got my eye on you, you little naughty person. You know, and it's like this, this suspicion demoralizes producing the very evils it's seeking to produce, right? So you want to have both of those quotations. What I love about this book, Child Guidance, is the compilers who've taken these quotations from different periodicals and different books. They put them in one volume by, by category of topics. Read through that book, Child Guidance. There's no substitute for that. This seminar quotes from it heavily, but reading it yourself is the number one preparation for understanding these biblical principles principles in your practical life. But take a look at this. Be one with the children in their exercises and amusements without leaving the impression that you are watching them. Are you following me on this? So we are watching them, but not because we're going, you're going to do something bad. I just know it. No, we're watching them because we're one with them. They're our kids. We love them. And so we're watching them basically all the time, so that we can be raising them and training them, right? But not in a way where it's like we're always suspicious of them. So just using that as an example so we can see how we look at quotations like these to look at them in a balanced manner. This one says we want to have a sanctified love that will bind the hearts of parents and children together. Isn't that what it says in Malachi? And the youth will grow up established in the faith and rooted and grounded in the love of God. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at the first part of the quotation. It says the work of education in the home, if it is to accomplish all that God designs it shall, demands that parents be, this is your first lesson today, are you ready? Be diligent students of the scriptures. They must be learners of the great teacher. Day by day, the law of love and kindness must be upon their lips. Their lives must reveal the grace and truth that was seen in the life of their example. But did you notice we can't just force that? We can't just manufacture that. We don't just become kind and have the law of kindness and truth on our lips. Where did it start? It says daily we must be students of the scriptures. Then we will naturally be displaying the life of our example, capital E, Jesus. Take a look at this one. George Barna found that successful parents in his research were people who studied their Bible and believed in their Bible. He calls it theologically conservative. Basically, they believe the Bible means what it says. They, were, they, were, they, they understood the, the creation, the second coming of Jesus, the flood. That this, this is a true book, like radical concept out there today, I know. But, but the spiritually strong young adults were raised by parents who believe in this book, who studied this book, who loved this book, capital B, the Bible. In order to interest our children in the Bible, we must ourselves be interested in it. To awaken in them a love for its study, we must love it. That's such a common sense statement, right? If they see us never interested in it, they will catch the cue that, well, it's really not that worthy of our time. It's just not that important. But if they see us pouring over the scriptures, praying through the scriptures, opening the scriptures regularly, day and night, I am burdened with the thought of our great need of converted parents. You know, if we're never in the word of God and we don't love spiritual things, 
We've got to go back to square one and realize that there is a loving Savior who reaches out his arms and says, I want to adopt you as my children. I want to call you my brother. I want to be your friend. I want to be your Savior, your King, your Lord. I want to issue commands, issue encouragement. I want you all in. I want to save you. We've got to go be born again. If we don't love the Bible, that's a pretty good assessment of where we stand with the Lord. And I don't mean to condemn Sometimes you look in the own mirror and you're going, okay, I got to die daily. I got to go back to this and say, Lord, please convert me to loving the Bible. And that's our great need. Converted parents, it said right there. Every day, parents should be receiving the light of heaven into the souls. Every day, be receiving the impressions of the Holy Spirit upon heart and mind. Every day, they should be receiving the word of truth and letting it control the life. Well, here's another finding from George Barna. Successful parents disciple their children. That's disciple, not discipline. We'll get to discipline also. But successful parents disciple their children. They do not look to the church to take the lead in spiritual training. They are involved in the church, using it as a support for their efforts. That sounds pretty wise, doesn't it? Doesn't that kind of sound like Deuteronomy 6? Deuteronomy 6 said, Parents, Hide these words in your heart. Teach them to your children as you rise up and as you lie down, as you walk by the way, as you sit down and as you go this way and that on your forehead, on the gates and the doorposts and all of that. It's giving you a picture of the home. That's the ultimate place of spiritual training, discipling children. Making disciples happens first and foremost in the home. Once we start to outsource this to the Christian school teacher, to the Sabbath school teacher, to the pastor, to the youth pastor, when we start doing that, this is, well, don't take it from me. Listen to this quotation. It says, it is perilous to leave this solemn duty in the hands of others. Perilous. Look at this one. Every family is a church over which the parents preside. The first consideration of the parents should be to work for the salvation of their children. So when we get up in the morning, we're praying for our kids. We're praying, Lord, help me to save. Help me to be your agency to minister unto my children that their souls might be saved by Jesus. So that's our number one goal with our parenting is to disciple our children. And we might ask the question, Okay, well, you know, at what age then can they be Christians? Uh, you know, when they're little, we're not really, you know, focused on converting them to, to the gospel. Well, age has nothing to do with it. As soon as the child can love and trust his mother, then he can love and trust Jesus as the friend of his mother. Isn't that a wonderful statement? One of the first sounds that should attract their attention is the name of Jesus. And in their earliest years, they should be led to the footstool of prayer. Their minds should be filled with stories of the life of the Lord and their imaginations encouraged in picturing the glories of the world to come. Let the first baby lispings be of Christ. And not only is that so precious and spiritually beautiful, but it's also just so adorable and cute as well to hear those little ones speaking of Jesus and saying his name in their own little two-year-old way. So it was in the hours of solitary prayer that Jesus in his earth life received wisdom and power. Let the youth follow his example in finding at dawn and twilight a quiet season for communion with their Father in heaven. Could our children learn these lessons in the morning of their years? What freshness and power, what joy and sweetness would be brought into their lives? So let's take that seriously. Let's have our children doing personal devotions from a very early age, even before they can read. You can put on audios, uh, CDs, MP3s, whatever, whatever method that you choose. Our ministry produces a whole 91-day uh, curriculum of, of, of seven or eight minute devotionals with hymns and scripture songs and you can play those and then, then repeat it the next quarter and then repeat it the next quarter and repeat it the next quarter because with small children who are pre-reading age, repetition is very, very good. There's another ministry out there called Thy Word Creations. They've got wonderful scripture songs that the children can listen to and they start memorizing the scriptures. And when you play these things and when they're babies, you know, hold them while you do it, right? And, and, and start this from a very early age so that they have this in the morning of their years, the freshness and power of a devotional life like Jesus had. If they have no knowledge of Christ, no connection with heaven, they will have no moral power. And they will yield to earthly potentates who have assumed to exalt themselves above the God of heaven in establishing a spurious Sabbath to take the place of the Sabbath of Jehovah. So we talk about the last day's deception and people who do not have their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ will just follow with the crowd this way and that instead of standing strong like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood. 
Here's another George Barna finding. Have you noticed, by the way, for every George Barna research finding, we've also seen these quotes that have been around for a long, long time saying the exact same thing. That's one of my favorite things about this is it validates those wonderful counsels we've been given. So here it is. Successful parents not only disciple their children and, and have them having devotions with the Lord and all of that, but they delve into matters of faith as a family unit. Spread out the word of God before your families in love and ask, what hath God spoken? Did you know that, according to other research, less than 10% of so-called born-again Christian homes, less than 10% of Christian homes ever open the word of God together during, at any time during a given week? Less than 10%. So in other words, 90% of Christian homes are not reading the Bible together ever at all during a given week. So we can, we can conclude that these really aren't Christian homes, not to judge somebody's salvation, but the, the, the fruit of this, the situation is this is not a Christian environment if the Bible is never opened, right? This is a generally vaguely secular environment. When, then why is there such a lack of missionary spirit in our churches? Well, it's because there's a neglect of home piety. You ever wonder why Laodicea is so Laodicean. I'm speaking from Revelation 3 right now about the last day's church that's lukewarm, that thinks it's okay spiritually, but it's just, it's just not, not clicking. It's not, it's not moving. It's not doing anything. It's because there's a lack of home piety, because that's where spirituality starts. It's where children are discipled. It's where you delve into matters of faith as a family unit. The teaching of the Bible truth is the great and grand work which every parent should undertake. In a pleasant, happy frame of mind, place the truth as spoken by God before the children. In all that men have written, where can be found anything that has such a hold upon the heart, anything so well adapted to awaken the interest of the little ones as the stories of the Bible? Oh, they love the Bible stories, don't they? Get the Blue Bible Story series, the 10-volume The Bible Story is what it's called. Great title for it because it's the great story of the whole of the Christian story and the biblical narrative. Children love that. For the little ones, get those red books, the My Bible Friends, and be reading. Then open the actual Bible as well in conjunction with these and, and read short selected passages of the Bible so they get accustomed to that as well. And the stories, make it a pleasant and happy thing. Use the felts, whatever it takes. Instead of speaking vain words and telling the children, Children, idle tales, telling idle tales to their children, they will talk with them upon Bible subjects. And you might say, Scott, why did you put the picture of the fiction section of the library up on there? Well, you know, we could, we could monopolize our children's entire childhood. We could fill their minds, we could fill every second of every day with pretend fake fantasy, fiction, sci-fi, non-true things that then all of a sudden take the place of that which is true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Philippians 4.8 says to dwell on that which is true, right? So why do we waste our time with Harry Potter and with Disney and with all these things laced with spiritualism and, and principles of evil? And I say that frankly and bluntly. You might be like, how could he say such a strong thing about these, about even Disney? Well, Get the DVD by Little Light Studios called Magic Kingdom, and you will understand the messages that are embedded in the content of Disney and the, the, the worldview presented therein. It's not presenting a biblical worldview. And even if it was innocuous, even if it was completely harmless and neutral, it's taking the place of something better, isn't it? And so then it's not neutral because it's occupying time and brain space that could be filling our kids with the truths of the Word of God. They're like little sponges, right? I mean, they're going to soak up everything that comes their way. They learn so quickly. And so let's take advantage of those early years. Let's take advantage of the time period of childhood where they're taking it all in. I mean, they can memorize hymns and scriptures way better than we can and so because it happens so quickly and naturally for them. Use this time window to the best possible, uh, the best possible effect that we can. The most successful methods of assuring their salvation and keeping them out of the way of temptation is to instruct them constantly in the Word of God, in a pleasant, happy frame, right? That could be kind of intense sounding, but always make it a pleasant thing. And as parents become learners with their children, because you might go, I don't know the Bible, I can't do this. Well, we learn it together with them. Then they will find their own growth and a knowledge of the truth more rapid. So 
When they are tried, tempted, or discouraged, this is how you do it constantly. You know, they're having a hard time. Well, cite them to the precious words of the Bible, the words of comfort. Gently lead them to put their trust in Jesus. Use object lessons throughout your day. When you see things in nature, draw them to the biblical examples of what these things mean on a spiritual level. Uh, talk about uh, you know, examples of, of children in the Bible or people in the Bible who, who went through things like that maybe could give us a lesson on how to handle this situation of our day. If we're continually bringing up the Bible, that will be the, the best way to assure their salvation, we read. Certainly very true from the Bible. Now, I want to talk very much about this hugely important topic of guarding their hearts. Because it's one thing to be filling them with the Bible, but if we're not watching out for the devil's assault upon them when we allow this to kind of be a mixed soup of toxic poison along with the good, and we have our kids consuming that, well, it could be deadly to them. So we want to talk about guarding their hearts. George Barna found a number of things. I'm just going to bullet point them off verbally for you so that you can kind of get the picture of some of his findings all just in one, in one list under this heading of guarding their hearts. First thing George Barna found is that the parents who had success in raising spiritually strong young adults were strict on media consumption. They did not allow their children to watch anything, play anything. They, they were very strict on media, media consumption. And so, of course, you've heard of media on the brain. That's the six-part series that takes on this issue of how just nefariously dark and, 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 and wicked this, this entertainment industry is in seeking to capture the minds of our children. I won't say anything more about that. You can watch that whole series to understand why we want to guard our hearts from media. But another area that Barna found here was that these parents were, were uh, very involved, in his words, heavily involved in every aspect of their children's lives. So they were one with their children, right? We heard that quotation earlier. It's not like something where we're like hovering and like annoying, but we love our children. We're friends with our children. We like being together. We're, we have a pleasant time together. We do fun things together. We're heavily involved in every aspect of their lives. Another thing is these parents realized that they were different from most families, and the children got the picture very early, very quickly, and they understood continually that, well, we do things differently. And sometimes if the children were tempted, to say, well, the such and such family doesn't have to do it this way, or these guys over here get to do this, why can't I? The parents stuck to their guns, so to speak. They, they, they said, this is firm, this is who we are, we're not budging. So they were not swaying on, on, on shifting sands um, according to the winds of change. Most importantly, and you might say not most importantly, but tied with some of these others, but these are all the most important, so... They were heavily involved in choosing their children's friends and associates. They did not allow the kids to just go and play with whoever they wanted to play with. Now, let me give you some quotations on that. It says, Fathers and mothers, do you allow your children to associate with other children without being present, to know what kind of education they are receiving? Do not allow them to be alone with other children. Give them your special care. So we want to be playing with our kids with other kids, right? Make this a bonding thing. Otherwise, we end up with a generation gap where the parents all get together and they like to kind of hang out and talk about their parent things and the kids go off and are playing all day with their friends. And then it's like, well, well what about the family being turned back to one toward, toward another, right? And so we want as much as possible. And that doesn't mean that they can never do anything with other kids while you're, you know, around. But we want as much as we can be involved with our children, with other children, and not have them going to do sleepovers and this kind of thing. And we have no idea what's going on. Well, then we're not raising our children at that moment. Other children are raising our children, right? So it says, let them, let other children visit your children in your presence. Good, good quotation there. It is impossible to overestimate the importance for this world and the next of the associations we choose for ourselves and more especially for our children. So that's a strong statement. I mean, the associations, the friendships, the peers that we choose for our children, it's impossible to overestimate the importance of that choice we make about who they're going to be hanging around with. Could my voice reach the parents all through the land? That's a strong preface. Again, it's like, here's the one thing I would say. If I could speak it out with a megaphone to the whole country, I would warn them not to yield to the desires of their children in choosing their companions or associates. Little do parents consider that injurious impressions are far more readily received by the young than are divine impressions. Now, people will say, Scott, this sounds like we're 
uh, sheltering our children, right? I mean, all the media, the worldly media is kept out, and we want to be very careful about our children's friends and associates and peers. And you're going to start, you know, uh, you know, keeping your children. What, you, what are you going to try and do? Get your children out of the world? Well, this exact quotation has been said before. We are in the world, they say, and we cannot get out of it. So the same objections, objections people make today were made 120 years ago, where people are, oh, come on, we're in the world. We can't get out of it. Listen to the response. But parents, we can get a good way out of the world if we choose to do so. We can avoid seeing many of the evils that are multiplying so fast in these last days. We can avoid hearing about much of the wickedness and crime that exist. So we're going to try to get away from worldliness and, 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 and guard our children's hearts from those influences that would tempt them into the devil's way instead of into the way of Christ. Now, this word shelter, I was thinking more about when I, when I looked at this quotation. It says, I have been shown that there should be a sacred shield around every family. Shield the children from contaminating influences. And as I was thinking about a shield, the purpose of a shield, of course, is a guard here to prevent against oncoming assaults of the enemy. And let's, let's say you're now in a uh, open field and a hailstorm starts, okay? And the hailstorm has begun. You would take this shield and you would turn it into a shelter, right? And you'd have that above you to prevent the hail from pelting your head, which is kind of a prudent and wise thing to do, right? So I remember when I was a, a, a young person and me and my youthful foolishness in, in our peer group and all of our worldliness, we, we would look at the families who were more conservative along these lines, who wouldn't go trick-or-treating and go to the movies and things like that, and we'd, we'd laugh at them, the homeschool kids down the road or whatever. We'd be like, oh, you, oh, those guys are so sheltered. Now, as I thought about the foolishness of that statement, it's like being out in a hailstorm, and they've found a shelter over here, and they're like, come on, guys, get under the shelter, and we're going, ha ha, you sheltered people, bam, and we're getting hit in the head with these, with these, uh, these hailstones, and we're laughing at people who've taken shelter. No, let's take this word back, is what I'm trying to get at. When we say we want to protect, shield our children from the enemy onslaught, from the temptations of the, dev of the devil, we could, we could say that is sheltering them from Satan, and that's a good Thing, right? So we can take that word back instead of being, well, I better not shelter my kids. They better watch some worldly media and do a little bit of these things. No way. The devil's not going to get a foothold in our homes. This is the raising of the remnant that we're trying to do. Their souls are on the line. Now, to be, to be uh, balanced here, there is such a thing as bad sheltering. Like people shelter their children from any challenges in life or shelter their children from any pain or having to learn to tie their shoelaces or anything like this. And, and we're, 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 we're kind of the, you know, the, 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 the mother birdie over the, over the children for too long, right? You know what I'm saying? So that's not the kind of sheltering we want to be doing. In fact, we'll get into that a little bit and the, the value of hardship the value of noble independence and children facing challenges in life. So we'll get into that, but, but just a disclaimer on that. Here you go again. From their infancy, the youth need to have a firm barrier. There's another way to put it. Built up between them and the world that its corrupting influences may not affect them. Every Christian family should illustrate to the world the power and excellence of Christian influence. Now that's an interesting statement because most people go, well... If you're not watching what the world's watching and doing all these things and playing with them and going to the public schools and all of this, then you're not going to have an influence on unbelievers. This quotation says it's the opposite. It says, by having a barrier between us and the world is how we form Christian influence to influence the world. You might go, I'm scratching my head. How does that work? Well, think about it for a second. If we immerse ourselves in worldliness and we dive with our children into watching all of the worldly media and getting involved with all of these sinful things, we become no different from the world, right? And if we're no different from the world, there's no influence to draw them to Jesus, right? It's once we become different and we are a peculiar people and we have so much joy and hope and good relationships and Fun, and we, we have such a happy Christian family with, with obedience and all of these things, then the world starts looking at those families and going, hmm, what are you guys doing differently? Yeah, we've kind of scoffed at you and thought you were a little weird, but it seems to be working for you. Why don't you tell us about the hope that you have? And Peter tells us in, in, in the, epistle, the epistles of Peter, he says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, right? So people are asking us. That's the implication there in, this, in the quote from the Bible, in the scripture. It says, be ready to give an answer 
So that means people are asking you, why do you have so much hope? What, what makes you guys such a joyful Christian family? And so we ought to have the power and excellence of Christian influence by building a barrier between us and the world so we don't have its corrupting influences. Then we can go to the world in missionary activity and we can draw them unto Jesus in a way where it's, where it's effective, where it's winsome, where we have something to share with them instead of just being merged right into the, the collective of, of sin. How about this one? Since they cannot always have the guidance and protection of parents and guardians, they need to be trained to self-reliance and self-control. They must be taught to think and act from conscientious principle. I am so glad that quotation is there because it's a wonderful balancing statement. Many people will end up going overboard on this concept of the barrier between us and the world, and they will do all their thinking for their children right through their teen years, and they will dictate everything with a rod of iron, and the children will never be learned to, learning to think for themselves, to make decisions, to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's just as big of a danger as throwing them into the den of lions of worldliness. If we never help them to come to that point, as the quotation said here, where they're being trained to self-reliance and self-control, so the whole idea about this barrier is to give them the, the power, to help them to be empowered to walk with the Lord on their own as we approach the last day's deceptions. Okay, another Barna finding. Successful parents are countercultural, and this causes them little stress or concern. <laughs> they accept from day one that their parenting will be different from most. Listen to the quotes on this. There should be less care for what the outside world will say, and more thoughtful attention to the members of the family circle. And this one, mothers should never allow their sisters or mothers to interfere with the wise management of their children. Ooh, that one gets close to home for some of us, doesn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, so we're not really worried about what other people think. You know, we're going to do what the Lord says to do, and if other people want to form an opinion about that, they can have an opinion that doesn't affect me. That's between them and God. I'm going to do what the Lord asks me to do. I want to please Him and not men, right? And, or, or in this case, uh, other, other women, mothers who, who might feel that, you know, family members are, you know, saying, well, maybe it should go this way or that way. And there could be wisdom in that counsel, so you can listen to it. But you don't want it to interfere with the wise management of the children. The votaries of fashion, we would call those the trendies, will never see or understand the immortal beauty of that Christian mother's work and will sneer at her old-fashioned notions and her plain, unadorned dress, while the majesty of heaven will write the name of that faithful mother in the book of immortal fame. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that just inspires me to go, who cares what other people think? Like, I needed to get over that in, like, seventh grade, right? I mean, if we're still worried about what other people think and it wounds our sense of our, you know, security, it's like the Holy Spirit's going to give you that backbone to be strong in the Lord and of a good courage. Here's another George Barna finding. Successful parents lived out what they were teaching to their children, which is kind of a duh statement because... You can say it all day. We're Christians. We believe in this. We do this. We are loving and kind. And then you might be living the opposite. And have you ever heard the phrase that more is caught than taught? There are more things that are caught than taught. In other words, children will catch from us so much of how life works and how God loves us and how to live the Christian life. They'll catch more from our example and how we do things than from the words we say and the instruction we give. Listen to this statement. Above all things else, let parents surround their children with an atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. That is awesome. And I love this quote because a lot of times we can get really intense. We're like, we're biblical Christians. We're going to get really focused on the truth. We're going to be the best parents ever. And all of a sudden we're kind of like, ah, it's too much, right? You want to have an atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. Because that's what you get when you say we're biblical Christians. Some people who are like that pharisaical mindset are actually departing from the scriptures and going man's direction. When we are in the word of God, we see the face of Jesus. We see the light and the character of Christ shining in the face of Jesus. And we're influenced by that, and then we carry that atmosphere to our children. And we carry this cheerfulness, courtesy, and love above all things else, it says. A home where love dwells and where it is expressed in looks, in words, and in acts is a place where angels delight to manifest their presence. 
the atmosphere thus created will be to the children what air and sunshine are to the vegetable world, promoting health and vigor of mind and body. Smile, parents. Smile, teachers. If your heart is sad, let not your face reveal the fact. Isn't that a good one? And you know, along those lines, have you ever heard the golden rule? You know what the golden rule is, right? Do to others as you would have them do to you. We, we apply that and think about that in our, in our peer group and with fellow adults, but we rarely think about it in terms of our children. Do to them what you would want done to you if you were in their shoes, right? It says, it says atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. I usually we talk about, you know, you shouldn't be rude to people, but are we rude to our children, right? It's like, well, they're my children. I got to boss them around and tell them a thing or two, right? And all of a sudden we find ourselves being rude to our kids and it's not necessary, right? Do to them as you would want done to you. Talk in a tone of voice that you would want talk to you. That's an important lesson. That's hard, I know. I know from experience, like, right? I'm not the expert on getting nailing all this down, but the truth is there. It's confronting each one of us right now. The golden rule, I mean, think about this. Our children are younger members of the Lord's family. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not saying we're on an equal level and we're not going to discipline them and be their parents, but it, in a way, they are just as human as us, right? And they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we want to be using that golden rule with them as well. Few realize, even the babies, right? Few realize the effect of a mild, firm manner, even in the care of an infant. The fretful, impatient mother or nurse creates peevishness in the child in her arms, whereas a gentle manner tends to quiet the nerves of the little ones. Now, I know that there are many times in our day where you get anxious, you get stressed, you get frustrated, the kids are doing this thing again that you told them 10 times not to do. And you, Okay, here's a, here's a great lesson for you. Are you ready for it? Here's a practical tool from Ministry of Healing from 100 years ago, a good respiration soothes the nerves. You take a deep breath, and what happens is there's a nerve right up here that links into the limbic system of the brain where you have all of those anxious feelings and, and frustrations. And that nerve is actually calmed. It's called the dorsal vagal nerve. And that nerve, they didn't know it back then, but the modern science is like, whoa, how did they know? Well, we know how they knew, but you can actually calm that with a deep breath. If you take nine deep breaths, this is a great thing to do if you're about to just like, just launch out and, you know, lash out on your children, just leave. Just get out of the room and go and take Nine, and you might, why, why say nine, Scott? Well, the, the studies have, been, have shown that the, the state of your nervous system changes after nine deep breaths. So you, you literally change the, the physiological, biochemical state of your body and brain after, after, after nine deep breaths. And I'm not talking about new age meditation. I mean, be in there praying, talking to the Lord, and filling your mind with the principles of Jesus, okay? A good respiration soothes the nerves. There's just a little tip on how to not have the peevishness and all of that, right? Successful parents love their children unconditionally. Unconditional means regardless of their behavior, regardless of their performance, just like God feels about us. We're his kids. He loves us, period. Nothing's going to change that ever, and it never can, because God is love. And if we want to teach our children about God, we are their window into the spiritual life and reality, so they'll see God's character in us. Boy, that raises the bar, doesn't it? I mean, that's kind of like, whoa, uh, I'm going to need some help. God alone is our sufficiency, we heard earlier, right? So unconditional love, you get the idea. They've had the worst day they've ever had as far as their behavior goes and disrespect of you and whatever. The worst day ever. You need to come with the most love you've ever had for them. I learned this lesson very, very distinctly when I, I started a habit and a pattern with my three-year-old. He's five now. When he was three, I started saying, every night I'm going to do a little ritual where I sing to you and give you a back rub and pray for you at bedtime. And he loved it. Like we were two or three days into that and he was asking, are we going to do it again tonight, Dad? And it was like this really special thing, okay? Then he had a major blowout disobedience issue where we had some serious firm discipline and things were not happy in the home at that point. And in this disciplinary process, we're sitting on the couch together and he looks up at me and he says, Dad, are you still going to rub your, my back and pray for me tonight? Like he felt like maybe my love for him was on the line here. And it was my opportunity to just, just break down and say, oh, of course, Levi, I'm going to rub your back and pray for you tonight. Every night. I mean, yeah, there's discipline and consequences here, but there's nothing you could ever do that would make me not love you. 
And that, that's just burned into my memory as this really vivid thing. And we can express this to our children in situations like that. And when they've disobeyed, we always say, I still love you. And it doesn't matter what you do. It's unconditional love. That's the principle at the heart of the character of God. Successful parents are also sacrificers. In other words, they give up their aspirations, their preferences for the benefit of the kids. You get that one? This one's hard. This is where we're confronted with our selfishness, where I want to watch the game. I want to go and pursue this, this uh, ladder, corporate ladder of advancement, and it's going to sacrifice all the time with the kids. I want to go do these things socially. I want to do this on social media. You name it. There's a million things we can do other than focus on our children. Good, successful parents are sacrificers. They give up their preferences for the benefit of the kids. And I'm not saying we don't have lives and, you know, guys have to have a job. In a lot of cases, ladies have to have a job and so on. But we're sacrificing to the extent that we can our preferences and our desires for whatever thing might benefit the children more than us doing that other thing. There's plenty of joy in parenting, of course, even in the day-to-day -day experience. But, frankly, sometimes... I'm not in the mood to play 25 rounds of hide-and-seek, right? One or two I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with. <laughs> My wife said, you know, it's frustrating to me when the four-year-old prefers to uh, gather the green beans from the garden in his truck by transporting them one at a time. That's just like, this is how it's got to go. I mean, the truck man here is taking them one at a time. In his little world, that's important. She's like, we got to get this job done. Take a deep breath. We're going to do it this way. Um, you know, the idea of, of discipline, that's never fun, is it? I mean, we're sacrificing what I'd rather do. And uh, it's, if I'm indulging him, really, I'm indulging myself and not having to follow through on enforcing things here. And so, in other words, we're sacrificing all the time, aren't we? And I speak to the young people sometimes. I used to teach high school. And a lot of, especially young ladies, some, some of the guys too, it's like we get this very idyllic picture of the future. And it's like, oh, you know, having children is going to, you know, be such a wonderful, happy thing that's going to fulfill me, right? And marriage and babies is this, just this, this, this thing that's so nice and it just makes life so great. It's true, it makes it great, but what sometimes we miss, it makes it great because we're having to become more like Jesus every day in setting aside what we want. Instead of pursuing it as, I'm going to get something out of this. I look forward to being able to do this because it'll be nice and fulfilling for my heart. It will if we don't view it that way. It will if we say, I want to bless this child. I, this, this, this man is, is, is a wonderful man and I want to support and, and, and be, his, be his, his, his partner, his mate, his spouse in this ministry endeavor that we are on to raise a family for the Lord. If you've got the spiritual angle, the other centered, out altruistic angle, of course it will be fulfilling, but frankly, if it's all about me and what I'm going to get out of it, parenting, marriage, family is going to be miserable. Because when you have selfish people all coming at each other in a marriage, it's like a train wreck, right? In a family. It's a, it, that's why families are going this way, because we're naturally selfish by nature. So if we're going to do this, we got to be converted. And be converted means self dies and Christ comes in. And Christ means self-sacrifice. Take up your cross and follow him daily. You get the idea. Here's a quote on that. Fathers should unbend from their false dignity, deny themselves some slight self-gratification in time and leisure in order to mingle with the children, sympathizing with them in their little troubles, binding them to their hearts by the strong bonds of love, and establishing such an influence over their expanding minds that their counsel will be regarded as sacred. Beautiful. Here's another finding. Successful parents engage in what George Barna calls God talk. I call that Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 is parents talk of these commandments as you rise up, as you lie down, as you walk by the way, as you sit down. It's, a, it's amazing. We actually talk about the Bible regularly, right? Talk about God. Talk about Jesus. Here's another way of saying it. Christ is not a stranger in their homes. His name is a household name. Show in your life that Jesus is everything to you. Help them weave Jesus into their experience. So Christianity and religion and the Bible doesn't just have relegated times where it is set in this, in this uh, compartment of life. No, it bleeds into and is woven into the fabric of our everyday experience, every moment of the day, infused with the principles of Jesus. When her children do wrong, she may present as a reproof the words of God. So there's an example of how to weave Jesus into the experience. Avoid tedious remarks, though. 
Short remarks and to the point will have a happy influence. If much is to be said, make up for briefness by frequency. So we're praying all the time with our children, just thinking about God talk and Jesus being a part of the experience all the time. Prayer, what a wonderful way to do that. Not just at mealtimes. In fact, there's another research finding where they, they identified that, again, less than 10% of born-again Christian families ever pray together at any time other than at mealtimes. It's like 90% of Christian families never pray together except at a meal? That's, that's not okay, right? I mean, we've got to be praying at, at every time we can. Pray before you drive. Pray before bedtime. Pray at morning worship. Pray at evening worship. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, pray when, when somebody's hurt. Pray when somebody's scared. Pray when, when we think of somebody who's in need, somebody whose family member just died. Pray for uh, when you hear an ambulance. I mean, there's a million times you can pray, right? One time as a family, this is just such a, such a fun thing because my wife keeps a little prayer journal of things we've prayed for that, that are like specific prayers that the Lord answers. And then we can read that to our children. Remember when Jesus uh, you know, and actually answered these prayers and, and, and you can see the, the power of God. In strange ways where you might not expect it as adults, we were harvesting our carrots one day from the garden, and uh, we had to lay them out, let them dry in the, in the, in the air and on, on tarps, and then at the end of the day, once they're dry, pack them into bins of sand, and then we can put them in the root cellar, and we can gather them out of there through the winter in Michigan, right? we got to have it that way. And it was a wonderful day, but there was a danger. There was a fear. It was the, rain, the forecast for rain. And we're like, this is not going to work out if it's going to rain. So we prayed that God would hold off the rain and that we would be able to get our carrots in the sand, in the bins, and put away in, in an efficient manner before the rains would come. Well, the day went on. No rain, no rain, no rain, no rain. The end of the day, we're putting the last carrot in, putting the sand over it, and I take the top and I put it on and it goes click Drip, 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 drip. The rain starts literally the second the bin top clicked on. And I'm going, that is not a coincidence that the rain started right then. It's like God wanted to show up for those children to show them that he's real, that he's there, that he answers prayer. And that's just one of many examples where you lose things. I mean, I don't know how many times we've had lost keys found and ministering angels guard children who are dedicated to God. If you have to separate as a family to go this way and that, dad goes to work or whatever, have a prayer together and say, ask the Lord to guard the family, as we're, as we're apart, as we need to be. Successful parents believe, this is maybe the most important finding of all of them. Successful parents believe that parenting is their number one job in life. Listen to these awesome quotes. Let not home education be regarded, regarded as a secondary matter. In other words, it's primary. It's the most important. We need to make the education of our children a business for their salvation depends largely upon the education given them in childhood. To the mother and father, the right training of their children is the most important work of their life. Are you catching that? It's like a business. It is the primary thing. It is the most important work of our lives. Here's more of them. When parents see the importance of their work in training their children, when they see that it involves eternal interests, they will feel that they must devote their best time and thought to this work. Make it your life work to form the characters of your children according to the divine pattern. There is no more important missionary field than your own home. The management and destruction of children is the noblest missionary work that any man or woman can undertake. Mothers bear a greater responsibility in their work than does the king upon his throne. Next to God, the mother's power for good is the strongest known on earth. An angel could not ask for a higher mission. Did you catch all that about the king and the angel and God and mothers? Let's, let's, let's sum that up, okay? God, obviously, is the most powerful agency in this world because he created it and he's the all-powerful God. Then it says, mothers are above kings and an angel could not even ask for a higher work. So it goes, God, mothers, angels, kings, and the rest of us, right? You might say, well, dads are up in there somewhere too, right? But anyway, from those quotes, we can derive the mother's work is very important. I think you got that idea. Even more important than the president of the United States. How sad it is then that many parents have cast off their God-given responsibility to their children and are willing that strangers should bear it for them. You might say, Scott, why put a picture of a school bus? I mean, isn't school a good thing? It can be. True education is God's appointed way to augment what the family is trying to do, and we're going to cover that this afternoon. 
But as a former teacher, I can say the vast majority of the students that I taught in Christian schools, public schools, charter schools, and, and, and all of the different schools I taught at, I was a stranger to most of those parents. And that's kind of a strange thing, right? That's a sad thing. That's, that's not an, uh, how it's supposed to go. If we have outsourced our parenting to the worldly schools, especially the worldly schools, and the worldly media, then what we've done is like what the ancient Israelites did when they sacrificed their children to Molech. Parents give their children to Satan with their own hands, like the apostate Jews making them pass through the fire to Molech. You might say, Scott, that's a little extreme of a comparison. How could you say such a thing? Well, think about this. In the ancient child sacrifice practice of, of, of absolute wickedness and evil and darkness and the, the killing of these children, it was the children's bodies that were sacrificed. Today, when we hand over our children into Satan's hands to be raised by the worldly entertainment media who are obviously indoctrinating them with all sorts of false worldviews. Same thing with the worldly schools who are inculcating their minds with a completely distorted view of reality and evolution and all of these things. When, when these are raising and training the children, it is not just attacking their bodies, but their souls. And that's even more serious. Jesus said, fear not the one who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So that's the most important thing of all. If you ignore your duty as a wife and mother, Remember, it's our number one job in life. If you ignore your duty as a wife and a mother and hold out your hands for the Lord to put another class of work in them, be sure that he will not contradict himself. He points you to the duty you have to do at home. If you have the idea that some work greater and holier than this has been entrusted to you, you are under a deception. That's a strong statement, too. I would never say that to somebody. That's definitely, I was like, I don't have that, that you know, that opinion of my uh, of somebody myself but if the lord is saying that to you listen up because the devil is deceiving the whole feminist movement out there said we're going to liberate women from this oppressive patriarchal institution called the family this institution of thousands of years that has kept women in their place so that they can't rule the society and you've had kingdoms and monarchies of men and the the patriarchally ruled oppressive and yeah there has been a lot of oppression actually of women of of lots of different groups throughout history but the family is not oppressive the family is one of the most joyful liberating peaceful agencies it's the social pillars of society the family is the most important social institution ever right and and according to God's design with the mother playing an especially key role in child rearing as a part of the physiological design that God has given to us but we've got the 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 propaganda coming from the academia and these people who are saying well you need to free yourself from the constraints of these things and then you will find your true value as a woman it's absolute hogwash because what they found in the research is as this development has taken place and mothers have said, you know what, I'm just not going to pay any attention to my children. I'm going to pursue other things and make this not just a secondary but like a tertiary job in life and I've got much more important things. That process equates with lower levels of life satisfaction and happiness for women. So there's an interesting finding from factual research from the scholarly community where it contradicts their, their theories about, about what they call feminism. Now, we want to believe in true progressive ideals. When you read the Spirit of Prophecy stuff from the 19th century, it is so cutting edge. I mean, you're going to see some quotes this afternoon where you're like, man, they were really bursting some of the bonds of artificial social constructs that, that unnecessarily bind people into artificial categories. So we want to be balanced in this issue, but let's not buy into the propaganda of the, of the so-called scholarly community and their theories about how you find happiness in life and the lies that motherhood is a degrading, low, oppressive social construct. No, motherhood is the highest calling anybody's ever been given on the face of this earth. And that is a fact as, as, as solid as the force of gravity. So how about this one? Let's talk about the guys now. I saw that but few fathers realize their responsibility. The father's duty to his children cannot be transferred to the mother. If she performs her own duty, she has burden enough to bear. Only by working in unison can the father and mother accomplish the work which God has committed to their hands. Fathers, this quote changed the direction of my life, literally. Fathers, spend as much time as possible with your children. I was teaching full-time and starting in this speaking ministry and trying to do both, this on the weekends and teach during the week, and we had a baby, and it's like, I'm not around at all. And I read that quote, and I'm like, oh, conviction, right? 
I'm going to have to choose one or the other. Do I want to be a teacher? Do I want to do this? Uh, will this pay the bills? And we prayed about it. We asked the Lord, which direction do you want us to go? We pursued full-time ministry, and he's allowed that to flourish and develop so that we can travel around the country, be together on the road, and it's Spend as much time as possible with your children in our unique situation has borne this, this uh, rather peculiar uh, manifestation. For most people, it's just, I'm going to do the best in my situation, right? And that's unique to each family and person, the person's career and giftedness and calling and mission work in their life. So you ask the Lord what that means in your setting. But if a man is engaged in business, which almost wholly closes the door of usefulness to his family, then he should seek other employment, which will not prevent him from devoting some time to his children. So notice it says seek other employment. It doesn't say find it. The Lord will do the finding, right? We do the seeking. We say, Lord, open the doors wherever you want me to be in terms of my employment so that I can have the maximum impact on my family. Another fi finding from the Barna research, uh, successful parents' homes typically had one full-time parent. And the socioeconomic status of the family was not a factor. Now, I've combined those two findings in one slide because immediately when we go, oh, no, full-time parent, that means one income family, that means we are poor, right? Well, and then we won't be able to do as well. And what he found was being middle class or upper middle class gave zero advantage in raising spiritually strong young adults. You might say, well, you have more resources at your disposal, and, and, and come on, isn't there an advantage? Nope. If you apply all of these principles, it does not matter what your income is. You have the exact same chances of success as somebody with higher and lower. In fact, if you're going to err on something, here, here's an interesting statement for you. Poverty, in many cases, is a blessing. And that doesn't mean you're like lacking clean drinking water and you're dying of diseases. This is just, it says it prevents youth and children from being ruined by inaction. In other words, they've got to work. They've got to be out there in the garden because we've got to supplement our, our grocery purchases with a little bit of our own homegrown stuff because we're, we're really tight on the finances and the children are really forced to work. And not in a, not in a child labor oppressive way where it's like, you know, you've got to whip out there or something, but where children are learning what, what, what human beings have done for thousands of years, right? And we'll talk more about that this afternoon, but you get the idea. The kids really are, are, are required to do that, and that can be a blessing. So one full-time parent. Is it really possible? Well, thankful hearts and kind looks are more valuable than wealth and luxury. And contentment with simple things will make home happy if love be there. I would venture to guess that a large majority or maybe just a plurality of the families that insist we have to have two full-time income parents and children raised by daycare and all of these situations, in many of those cases, it's just a matter of our standard of living. We just want a higher standard of living, right? And, and it's like we want the what, frankly, in our culture today is wealth and luxury. We might not view it that way because everybody else around us is living this way. But compared to human beings in the past and throughout the world today, we're living in the lap of luxury. And if we have to clamp down some in order to have one of the parents raising those children to the extent possible, then you make those sacrifices. Now, I don't want to paint too broadly uh, brush strokes here because there are unique situations of you know, serious financial problems, and so every situation is unique. And you take that to the Lord. You say, you know, where can we make sacrifices? How much time can we carve out if we need to be pulling back some of the employment of, of if we've got a two-income family? If we've got a single, single parent home, you know, that's obviously a unique situation as well. So we want to, be, want to be very sensitive to those unique situations. But everybody has the same mandate from God. Spend as much time with your children as possible, right? And, and dial back some of those needs and realize they're just wants, right? They're just things that we like to have. We don't necessarily need to have. Sit down with that budget and say, all right, what could we live on if we, if we had, had to really pull back some of, the, some of the, um, the income here? So successful parents spent hours in dialogue with their children. And successful parents invested enormous quantities of time with their children, not just brief times of quality time, but quantity time that was also quality in nature. So lots of dialogue, lots of time, and that time is quality. So kind of pairing all that together brings us these quotations. Cultivate friendship with them, especially with your sons. In this way, you will be a strong influence for good. 
But no time, says the father. I have no time to give to the training of my children. No time for social and domestic enjoyments. Then you should not have taken upon yourself the responsibility of a family. By withholding from them the time which is justly theirs, you rob them of the education they should have at your hands. If you have children, you have work to do in union with the mother in the formation of their characters. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we don't work. I mean, you've got to provide for your family. That's something that God has, the Bible says, if a man does not work, he shall not eat, right? So we work, and we're away from the family, many of us, most of us, in that situation. But, you know, when I was first a dad, Levi was born, our, our oldest was born, and I was totally uh, just fanatic, okay? And you know, what, you know what fan is short for, right? Fanatic. I was, I was a sports fan, okay? And I had grown up in a sports fan family, and it's like we never missed the game. And I started to ask myself, well, I'm watching that, and the, the kid will be doing this over here, and it's like, is this what I want him to learn about the Christian life, right? And, and is this the amount of time that I can spend with him? So I started to notice areas of my life that weren't my job that I could, that I could sacrifice in order to have that time. So that's what we read earlier about sacrificing your children. That was one example from my, from my life. You ask the Lord what yours is, but here's the idea. You have brought children into the world who have had no voice in regard to their existence. You have made yourself responsible in a great measure for their future happiness, their eternal well-being. The burden is upon you, whether you are sensible of it or not, to train these children for God. Isn't that an interesting philosophical, like, uh, kind of make your mind explode a little bit? Like This human consciousness, this person, this being, this living, breathing, feeling, thinking person exists because you made a decision for them to exist. So whose responsible, this responsibility is it that they have a happy life? Of course, that's on us, right? So we need to do everything we can. It is the cry of many mothers, I have no time to be with my children. Then, for Christ's sake, spend less time on your dress. Neglect, if you will, to adorn your apparel. Now, we don't do as much of that today, but maybe we're shopping a lot or thinking about our clothes a lot or trying on clothes or talking with our friends about clothes or whatever. You get the idea, the dress and the apparel. Neglect to receive and make calls. That would be social engagements. Neglect to cook an endless variety of dishes. Neglect to keep up on Facebook posts. Neglect to watch TV. Neglect to be on your phone. That was not in the original. I added that to update some examples here. I just read an interesting report recently that the average parent spends 9 hours and 22 minutes on media per day. And only 90 minutes of that is for work. So we're talking almost 8 hours. I'm going, what? I mean, I was shocked that teens were doing nine hours of entertainment. Parents are doing eight. It's only a little less. Uh, this is not okay, right? And 96.6% of toddlers are using mobile devices. In one study that they did, a focus group of 40, 40 families, a, small, a study of 40 families, they found none of the parents had their children abstaining from devices. All of them, 100% of the children, preschool age, and the majority of those parents were not interacting with their children at all while they were doing these, these things. So they were doing their own, of course, right? So this is a serious, serious thing. I have no time to be with my children? No, no, you do. We just need to make time, right? Never, never neglect your children. What is the chaff to the wheat? Let nothing interpose between you and the best interests of your children. Let not a mother allow her mind to be occupied with too many things. She must allow nothing to divert her mind. Now, my wife, I asked my wife about this one. I said, hey, honey, what, what should I say to moms, though, who are like, well, I'm not going to get everything done then. She goes, you won't. Oh, well, that's, that's kind of a simple answer. Well, it's, it is that simple. You just won't get everything done, right? It's like, I got so much to do. I won't get everything done if I'm raising my children. You won't. You know, we get used to that idea. We prioritize things. We work with dispatch. We do our best. We don't let the stress of not getting everything done, uh, you know, mess us up. We must allow nothing to divert our mind from this great task. Not until the final settlement, when the cases of all will be decided, and the acts of our entire lives will be laid open to our view in the presence of God and the Lamb and the holy angels, will parents realize the almost infinite value of their misspent time. That's a big deal, how we spend our time. We've got to give our kids the right conception of God through the knowledge of Christ who died that we might be saved. And that should be impressed upon the children's minds. You may think, parents, you have not time to do all this, but you must take time to do your work in the family, else Satan will supply the deficiency. Cut out everything else from your life that prevents this work from being done. 
and train your children after his order. Neglect anything of a temporal nature. Be satisfied to live economically. Bind about your wants, but for Christ's sake, do not neglect the religious training of yourselves and your children. Here's another one. Successful parents were trying to obey God in their parenting. Well, that's simple, because God established the family relation. His word is the only safe guide in the management of children. And, of course, when you're training and raising the children, the number one job is, who are they becoming, right? What kind of kids are they? What kind of young adults will they be? What kind of Christians will they be? The development of their character is number one. That's the number one focus. And that involves many aspects. Here's one of them, and I always feel bad bringing up this slide because this poor little girl, she gets the picture of being the spoiled brat princess look, but I'm sure she's such a nice girl in other settings. But many times we do that, don't we? We spoil our children. We indulge our children because toys are so cheap these days, right? I mean, it's no sacrifice to give them a hundred of them. But those children for whom parents do the most, so we do everything for our kids, they don't have to do any chores. They don't have to contribute to the meals. They don't have to clean up their own toys, etc. You know what? They're not going to go, oh, mom, you've been so nice. You've been so kind. You've been so generous to do all these things for me. Let me pay you back. Let me really make, you know, settle the score and, and help you out with some things. No. The children for whom parents do the most frequently feel under the least obligation toward them. It's called being spoiled, right? From infancy, children should be trained to do those things which are appropriate for their age and ability. From the earliest childhood, I mean, this isn't like once they're 10, this is when they're toddlers they can be helping out, right? Even a baby, just involve them in the laundry, stick them in the laundry basket, right? And they're playing with the clothes, they're helping, right? Keep these children with you. I love that quote. There's one to just remember. Keep these children with you. Now, I just have to pop in and add something real quick here. We'll get right back to the seminar in a moment. But have you ever noticed what the Deuteronomy 6 life looks like? It says, parents, hide these words in your heart. Talk about them with your children when. Well, let's take a look. When thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Well, that pretty much sounds like daily life being lived as a family. When you're sleeping, when you're sitting, when you're up and you're down, when you're getting up, when you're walking, literally just doing life with your kids is at the core of God's blueprint for parenting. Doing life with your kids. That's what it means to turn the hearts of the family members toward one another again, to fulfill Malachi's prophecy. Doing life with our kids. It's a radical concept. Let's see if we can employ that in our day-to-day -day life. Let them ask questions and in patience answer them. Give your little children something to do and let them have the happiness of supposing they help you, even if it's one green bean at a time. If they make mistakes, if accidents happen and the dishes are, you know, the sprayer sprays everywhere and the soap gets on everything, do not blame them. Things break, it happens, right? The more quiet and simple the life of the child, this is a great quote, the more free from artificial excitement, entertainment, media, all of that, and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and to spiritual strength. Did you get that one? We want a simple, natural life for the children. We don't want them swimming in toys. We want them playing with natural things outdoors, in the, in the dirt, digging, digging uh, in the ground, etc. To live in the country would be very beneficial to children. An active out-of-door life would develop health of both mind and body. They should have a garden to cultivate where they might find both amusement and useful employment. This is our family slideshow. Kids helping there with the groceries. That's at a health food store near where we live where they have the kids' size carts. We're unloading the dried beans and you got the toddler just right in there, right? And grandma, what a wonderful grandma they have, gives the kids presents that will help them be helpful. And when our kids open presents, they have a little routine. They have to comment on it. In some way, they have to acknowledge how this present will help them to be a blessing to others, to learn more about God, or to help them develop. And, and, and so it's not like, ooh, just a toy fun for me, right? And you might be like, seriously, it's a present, Scott. But no, everything in life is spiritual, right? And they, this isn't some oppressive thing where they don't like it. They, it's like, how is this going to help you? help you develop. So if it's Legos, oh, this will help me, you know, in my development because I'm going to be building and problem solving the Lego thing, right? So my mom gave the, uh, gave the um, wheelbarrow there to our, to our son so that we could work together. Uh, there's the garden on our, our acreage that we live at in Michigan, the kids-sized um, 
uh, rake there and hoe that, that, that the folks got him, also the grandparents got him, helping out with Belt of Truth Ministries and shredding of the credit card information, climbing the wood pile when we're stacking the wood for the winter, etc. You get the idea, but here's, here's an important thing. It's not about efficiency, right? Give these children something to do means you're not going to get as much done. It's just the bottom line, right? And so realize that when you're going into it, that it's, this, this is about character development. It can be so given that the child will find pleasure in learning to be helpful. It's pleasurable to them. That's not one of, one of mine. That's back to the stock photos. Mothers can amuse their children while teaching them to perform little offices of love, little home duties. Bring all the pleasure possible into your exercises as a teacher and educator of your children. Make the life of your children pleasant. And at the same time, teach them to be obedient and helpful, bearing small duties as you bear large ones. The little child finds both diversion and development in play. That's an important thing. You know, play is a part of their day. That's a part of their development. That's not something where they're getting away with something. It's like, no, this, I, I'm going to assign this period to you. This is diversion and development time. Go and, and play with your trucks. And, and they come up with all sorts of scenarios of what the trucks are doing or whatever, right? And so for very young kids, work and play is the same thing. While they're working, they're playing. And as they get older, it gets a little more serious and rigorous, of course, that they have to, they have to be efficient. So when I'm talking about it's not about efficiency, like we got young people, well, yeah, we need to be getting a lot done. We got to get a little more focused on that. But you get the idea. Successful parents meet their children's emotional and physical needs. Oh, man, this one is important. Because many people go to parenting seminars or learn parenting principles because they're struggling with their children's uh, behavior so much. And they're going, oh, well, how, how do I help my children obey? How do I discipline my children? And they want the, the discipline procedure. They want the, okay, how do the, how do the timeouts go? How do I get the children's behavior in order? And, and, and you can have that discussion. That's important. The how to do discipline thing and punishments and consequences and all that. But did you know that 90% of misbehaviors can be tracked back to unmet physical and emotional needs? And let's talk about a few of those right now. Now, I want to jump in real quick. We'll get right back to the seminar again. But I want to say that this portion of the seminar especially is just barely scratching the surface. Because when we talk about the emotional and physical needs of children, we've got to discuss that in much greater depth. And frankly, understanding why children misbehave in the first place is a huge question. And then not to mention gaining the biblical tools for discipline. To learn more about raising godly children, this is the full Raising the Remnant 6 DVD series. And I recommend especially viewing Discs 3 and 4. Disc 3 is entitled Weighed in the Balance and Disc 4 entitled Those Whom I Love, I Discipline. Not to mention Discs 5 and 6, How to Raise the Remnant. Those are the practical guides for raising godly children in these last days. And I don't know a single parent who doesn't crucially need these counsels in this time in Earth's history. We'll go right back to the seminar now. Physical needs, how about the, the right nutrition? If kids are eating um, you know, at all times of the day and their stomach's not in, it's working, overworking and their digestive system's not in good health, it manifests in the brain and in anxiousness and in peevishness and all of these things and then misbehaviors. If they are, haven't drank water, right? Their brain's not firing in all cylinders and they're frustrated or they haven't slept enough. You get the idea. Good sleep, right nutri nutrition. They need to be, sleep and food need to be regular, meaning at appointed times and abundant. Regular and abundance. You want it at appointed times. It's not haphazard. You're not eating six times a day. You got your three meals spaced apart. In fact, I've got some quotations on that. The importance of regularity in the time for eating and sleeping should not be overlooked. Since the work of building up the body takes place during the hours of rest, it is essential that in youth that sleep should be regular and abundant. Now also plenty of physical activity in addition to that. If they're indoors all the time, sitting all the time, that's not going to be good either, and they start to get anxious and start acting out as well. If all would eat at regular periods, not tasting anything between meals, they would be ready for their meals and would find a pleasure in eating that would repay them for their effort. And you might say, well, don't kids need to eat you know, in between meals because they're just kids and stuff? And it's like, no, absolutely not. Um, when you see kids who have, who have just, whose, their stomachs have been trained to eat three times a day, they know how much food to take in to have the, the sufficient caloric intake and nutritional value. And so they aren't needing food. They're not hungry. They don't feel hungry at all. My kids never feel, they never ask for food or think about food. And it's just, has never come up uh, to, to want to eat in between meals because it's only at meals. And when you're strict about that, then, then they eat enough at their meals. 
After the regular meal is eaten, the stomach should be allowed to rest for five hours. Not a particle of food should be introduced into the stomach till the next meal. Now, when you look at your schedule for the day, and I hope you have a schedule, because that's part of emotional needs, is having routine. Children thrive on a routine. Parents, inaction is the greatest curse that ever came upon youth. I mentioned not having physical activity, not being outdoors. The greatest curse that ever came upon youth is that they sit in a desk and in front of a screen all day long. Isn't that an amazing statement? Inaction is the greatest curse that ever came upon youth. The health cannot be preserved unless some portion of each day is given to muscular exertion in the open air. Small children should be left as free as lambs to run out of doors, to be free and happy. Don't they love it? I mean, my son's favorite thing to do is ride his bike. It's happy for them because their bodies need it, their brains demand it, they just love it. They're outside running around. And that's going to give them a favorable opportunity. Equalize the taxation of the mental and physical powers. So when we talk about true education, we talk about how to build our day, half and half, study, academics, 50%, physical activity, 50%, equalize them. Successful parents raise families that regularly serve others together. And this is a basic concept, right? I mean, are we living lives of self-sacrifice? Are we thinking about the elderly? Are we thinking about the needy and the poor? Do we talk about them? Do we pray for them? Do we give? Do we, how about this one? I love this quotation. It says, children are to be educated to deny themselves. At one time I was speaking in Nashville. The Lord gave me light on this matter. It flashed upon me with great force that in every home there should be a self-denial box. That into this box, the children should be taught to put their pennies that they would otherwise spend for candy and other unnecessary things. So the children have their own finances, right? Maybe we, we've got a portion of the day where they, they work and they earn money and then they're responsible for a portion of their, their clothes and other things like this. And you keep it very simple when they're young and a little more, a little more complicated as they get older. But, um, you know, when, when you think about, well, maybe I'd want to buy this unnecessary thing. Wait a minute. Maybe the Holy Spirit is asking us to sacrifice that and put it in the self-denial box to give to the poor. Successful parents prayed a lot for their children. That's the most important finding. I know I already said that one time, but this one is definitely the most important because prayer is the power, is where the power is found. I know of nothing that causes me so great sadness as a prayerless home. Pray much more than you do. Your compassionate Redeemer is watching you in love and sympathy, ready to hear your prayers and render you the assistance which you need in your life work. He knows the burdens of every mother's heart and is her best friend in every emergency. His everlasting arms support the God-fearing, faithful mother. Isn't that encouraging to know? Mothers and fathers, too. That applies to dads as well. That's encouraging because his, his arms are everlasting. He's got the strength to support us in this epic, impossible task. Difficulties will arise. We can all say amen to that, right? You will meet with obstacles. But look constantly to Jesus. When an emergency arises, ask, Lord, what shall I do now? If you refuse to fret or scold, the Lord will show you the way. Parents, are you working with unflagging energy in behalf of your children? The God of heaven marks your solicitude, your earnest work, your constant watchfulness. He hears your prayers. With patience and tenderness, train your children for the Lord. All heaven is interested in your work. God will unite with you, crowning your efforts with success. That is such an encouraging one. Remember these. Look those ones up. Now, this one is my favorite of all. It's so moving. So, what a beautiful picture. It says, when the judgments shall sit and the books shall be opened, when the well done of the great judge is pronounced, and the crown of immortal glory is placed upon the brow of the victor. Many will raise their crowns in the sight of the assembled universe and, pointing to their mother, say, She made me all I am through the grace of God. Her instruction, her prayers have been blessed to my eternal salvation. Do you want to hear that in that great day? I do. As a dad, I think dads can be included in that as well. But you've heard some pretty strong statements about the mother because those early years are so important. Those who are in that phase, prayerfully take serious this time that you have to form the characters of those children. And as they get older, don't, don't let that go. I mean, we are, our, we are their parents all the way through. And then when we get to heaven, they can say, that and we will feel so much joy that they are there and not just that
but that they helped finish the work that we saw earlier. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your promise that you will finish this work and that our children have the privilege of serving in this great missionary cause. We just ask that you would please bless our families and our homes with your spirit, with your angels. Help us to make the choices and the decisions that need to be made which invite your presence, which bring in the influence of your holy angels. And we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus that he has wrought out our salvation, that he has loved our children enough to go to the cross for them. Help us to take up our cross on behalf of our children, deny ourselves, and make this our number one job in life. Whatever that means in each per unique person's situation, we know that you are holding up the arms of, of, the, of the single mother, of the struggling family, of every single family that's feeling so, so dysfunctional, so uh, in, incapable. Each one of us knows our weakness. And if we don't, please reveal that to us, that we need to rely on your everlasting arms. Strengthen our weakened will. Give us the power to overcome self so that we can work on behalf of our children daily. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.